Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host John Lorden and today we're looking into a bit of a famous case. This is the case of Tara Lee Calico and it became very famous because of a photograph that came out after her disappearance. Um, it's still kind of debatable if it was her or not, but this case has been featured on just about every true crime television show that you could imagine that was on in the 90s. Uh, it was even featured on Oprah. And now we're taking a look into it. And, you know, occasionally I look into certain stories um, and they don't come out quite as I'm expecting, especially a case like this. There is a very popular version of the story that is out there. And uh, Basically, at the end of my research, you'll see that I've bumped into some information that uh, maybe tells a little bit of a different story, um, and it certainly is a rabbit hole that is worth going down if you really want to truly understand what's going on uh, in this case, or at least some very strong possibilities. I can't say for certain that those things are true or not, but um, there certainly are a lot of theories about what happened to Tara. So let's start with the Charlie Project at charlieproject.org. And here we can see some photos of her, including an age progression that was done. This is a bit of an old case. She went missing September 20th, 1988 from Belen, New Mexico. Um, she is endangered missing. She was born February 28th, 1969. She was 19 years old at the time that she went missing. Five foot seven, 120 pounds, Caucasian female, brown hair, green eyes. Calico has a large scar on the back of her right shoulder and a scar on her calf. She has a dime-sized brown birthmark on the back of one of her legs. She has a lazy eye and a cowlick on her right temple. She has previously had braces on her teeth, last seen wearing an orange sweater. Now this is one of the, actually, one of the largest profiles I've seen on the Charlie Project in terms of writing about it. So um, we're going to go over most of those details, but I want to jump through a couple websites to do that. So heading over to wikipedia.org, it has a bit more of a concise uh, description of what happened. On Tuesday, September 20th, 1988, Calico left her home at about 9.30 a.m. to go on her daily bike ride along New Mexico State Road 47. She rode that route almost every morning and was sometimes accompanied by her mother, Patty Dole. However, Dole stopped riding with Calico after she felt she had been stalked by a motorist. She advised Tara to think about carrying mace, but she rejected the idea. On the morning of Calico's disappearance, she had told Dole to come and get her if she was not home by noon, as she had plans to play tennis with her boyfriend at 12.30. Dole went searching for her daughter along her usual bike route, but could not find her. She then contacted the police. Pieces of Calico's Sony Walkman and a cassette tape were discovered along the route. Dole believed that she might have dropped them in an attempt to mark her trail. Several witnesses observed a light-colored pickup truck, possibly a 1953 Ford, with camper shell following her. So right off the bat, I'm a bit concerned um, that it seems like she was having trouble with being followed even prior to this. Um, obviously, it doesn't seem like she took very good safety precautions. Of course, this is back in 1988, so cell phones or things like that are definitely not an option here. Um, and it is curious that the cassette tape, and from what I understand from other articles, it was just the window of the Walkman player uh, were found. And uh, the cassette tape, from what I understand, was by a band uh, known as Boston, which uh, some of you might be too young to know out there. But um, they are fairly certain this is her tape, although I haven't run into any information about any tests that they've done or how they've found that co conclusively. Um, I know back in the 80s, uh, I used to make copies of tapes and you know you would use your handwriting to say what they were. So I don't know if this was a copy of a tape or if it was an actual uh, a cassette that was pressed specifically for Boston that just had the artwork uh, and the titles of the songs on it. Um, I would assume because they've been so strong in every description that I've read about the tape, I would assume that it might have been a copy and it might have been her handwriting because they are they're very very confident that this was uh, her tape. Then we get to the photograph and here you can see uh, a picture of it. Very disturbing photo um, when you look at it at face value of course. On June 15, 1989, a Polaroid photo of an unidentified young woman and a boy 
both gagged and seemingly bound, was found in the parking lot of a convenience store in Port St. Joe, Florida. And I actually appreciate how they phrased that there about them being seemingly bound. Um, if I was going to fake a photo like this, all I would need are two young people and two pieces of tape, and it would be extremely easy to fake this type of photo. There are a lot of people debating on Reddit and other threads about the expressions on their face. Are these people truly scared? Was this photo done just as a mock-up of some kind or some kind of bad gag? Uh, also, where this is found is approximately 1,600 miles away from where she was living. Um, so it seems like it's a bit of a stretch if it could be them and you're looking at about nine months later of course um, if you know if she was abducted and taken cross-country in a van or something like that it's perfectly feasible that she could have been in Florida by uh, by nine months after uh, in particular the little boys expression seems to come up quite a bit where people are saying you know that kid just doesn't look scared um, it's really tough for me to make a judgment, especially when you don't know these people's faces or what they would look like without the tape on them. Um, but it does just kind of strike me. It would be just so easy to fake this type of photograph. And um, I don't know. I really don't know if it's valid. Outside of that, there's a second question. Is it really Tara Calico? And I looked fairly closely. I have some problems personally, um, particularly with her eyebrows and around her eye section uh, and her ears. Tara does not have loose ear lobes. Her ears connect directly to the side of her head. It's kind of hard to see in this photo, but it looks to me like uh, this young girl actually has uh, ear lobes that are, that are loose, but it is very difficult to tell. This photo uh, is somewhat grainy when you start zooming in on it uh, too great, but Let's continue. According to Polaroid officials, the picture had to have been taken after May 1989 because the particular film used in the photograph was not available until then. Uh, and in regards to the boy, relatives of Michael Henley, also of New Mexico, who had disappeared in April of 1988, saw the episode of a current affair that this photo was um, featured on and said they believed it was the boy in the photo. Uh, Dole said she was convinced that it was her daughter after taking, quote, time, growth, and lack of makeup into consideration. She also noted that a scar on the woman's leg was identical to one Calico had received in a car accident. In addition, a paperback copy of V.C. Andrews' My Sweet Audrina, said to be one of Calico's favorite books, can be seen lying next to the woman. Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and concluded that the woman was Calico but a second analysis by the Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed. An FBI analysis of the photo was inconclusive. So you have professional opinions all weighing in here, coming in in different places. In terms of the favorite book thing, I don't know how popular that book was back then, but just because a book is the favorite of someone's, I don't know that that adds any viability of this being her. Um, from other information I've researched, it was not her particular copy of the book. That was still apparently at her home. So you would have to believe that if she was kidnapped, that she asked the kidnapper or told the kidnapper about her favorite book at some point and they got it for her. I think it's, I guess it's feasible. And about the boy, the identification of the boy in the photograph as Henley is considered unlikely. His remains were discovered in 1990 in the Zuni Mountains, about seven miles from his family's campsite from which he had disappeared. But I do think there is a very important lesson in the discovery of his remains. Um, if, you, if you look into this case, they always couple it up with that young man's disappearance. And it's fairly obvious that he was camping with his family. His family was setting up their camp. They weren't really paying attention to him. And it seems like he wandered off. Then a fierce storm came in and it seems like uh, the elements uh, took him. But for the truth of this photograph, you have two separate families that are looking for hope. They're looking for the hope that their loved one is still alive, and both of them see it in this photograph. One of them learns fairly quickly that that hope was misplaced. And I do think that that might be a valuable lesson um, for Tara's family as well, but uh, it's tough because whenever you see the story talked about, so much time is dedicated to this photo, so much attention is given to this photo, um, and I think it kind of obstructs some of the other information 
uh, in particular the information I was talking about earlier, which we will get to by the end of this video. Later developments, 20 years after her disappearance, Rene Rivera, the sheriff of Valencia County, claimed that he knew what had happened to Calico. According to Rivera, boys who knew her drove up behind her in a truck and some form of car accident followed. Calico later died and those responsible covered up the crime. Rivera stated that he knew the names of those involved, but that without a body, he could not make a case. He did not release the evidence that led him to this conclusion. No arrests have been made and the case remains open. Calico's stepfather, John Dole, disputed these claims, saying that the sheriff should not have made these comments if he was not willing to arrest anyone, and that strong circumstantial evidence should be enough for a conviction. Jumping over to crimefeed.com, this is a bit of a recent article, September 20th, 2016, uh, on this, and it's kind of a nice recap of the official story, though I did find a major gaffe in the information. Um, this is saying that the bike was found, and according to several other sources I've found, uh, the bicycle was never found. And that is a bit of an important fact for me, because if you're thinking about this as an abduction, why is someone going to take the bicycle? Uh, if you think about this in the scenario that the sheriff was suggesting, where maybe there was some type of accident that happened, then it might make sense for someone to take the bicycle so that they could obstruct that accident. For example, if, you know, if a truck did hit a bike, there's going to be paint transfer, there might be damage to the bike um, that could be measured back and um, lined up with the dimensions of the truck. There's forensic evidence that happens as soon as two vehicles interact with each other. So if it was truly an accident, it makes more sense to me that the bike would have been taken in that case than if this was just a straight up abduction. Uh, also worth noting on this uh, write up, they've included a link to a repost of a Paranormal Anna feature on this story. And I, if you're a longtime brain scratcher, you know I'm a very big fan of Paranormal Lana's. Unfortunately, her account is no longer active. She is no longer making these types of videos. But I do have a link down below to this repost of the video so you can see it for yourself. A very good retelling of, once again, what I consider the official story. Um, and she even goes into the aftermath of the family a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, Tara's biological father deceased uh, in, I think, around 2002. Uh, her mom winds up dying in 2006. That being said, she still does have siblings and a stepfather that are wondering what could have possibly happened to her. For current news, um, we get a little ping in December of 2014 about some bones that are found in Valencia County. They test them very quickly, thinking that they could be related to this case, but unfortunately they are not. And if you go to terracalico.com, you're going to see um, information about a documentary that is being made. And if you research into this, you can see that this is a documentary that's been going on for, it's probably been in development for six or seven years now. Uh, it is a friend of hers that is essentially reinvestigating the case. Uh, she used to live in the area. I believe she now lives in Los Angeles. She got an actor from Breaking Bad, which shot in New Mexico, um, to help fund her documentary project. Uh, unfortunately, she got a lot of press for this project around 2013, 2014, and she kept saying, oh, we're probably about a year away. Um, they did a campaign to try to raise some funds. They were looking to raise, I think, about 50 grand, they said, to basically help complete the production, but to also protect them legally. Hint, 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 because I do believe if this information is accurate that we're going to get to at the end of this video, they might have some concern for um, legal ramifications if they release that theory. But uh, unfortunately, that fundraiser did not do very well. It only um, scratched up, I think, 2,000 more dollars. But on this website, the latest news update is as of July. And they're saying um, they're finally getting to the end and they're now making it an eight to 10 part uh, documentary series. I don't know if they're hoping to sell it to HBO or Netflix or something like that. Um, it, there certainly seems to be enough information to go over in this case to have more than a straight up documentary. So I am extremely anxious to see um, what they have worked on. 
And if they happen to watch this video, um, I would love to review this documentary series for you guys. Um, I would love to help even tell my audience about it. Um, I think this case really deserves a lot more attention, especially the information that isn't just the popular story that everyone is kind of retold time and time again. But we'll see what happens around that. So what is this information I keep allu alluding to? Well. It came from, at least the link I found, came from a Reddit thread posted by someone calling himself Bert Gummer 1911 And he states here that um, it's highly likely that much of the case, including even the approximate location of Tara Calico's body, has already been pieced together. And then it links to a PDF file that looks like it is official documentation from an investigation, a few investigations that have gone on around this case. The person that posted this uh, calls themselves public records requester. And let me just tell you right now, I don't know how long stuff like this stays available. Unfortunately, you have to have a paid account here to save this file or I would have saved it for myself. Um, if any of you are um, subscribed to, I don't, know how to say it, scribd, I guess, dot com. Um, please save a copy of this file somewhere. But even outside of that, if you're just a viewer of the show, check out that link in the description box below. Get to this document before it goes anywhere and read through the entire thing. Um, I think you will be shocked, maybe a little bit disturbed. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna try to go through it with you, but it would literally, it's 22 pages. I mean, I could literally probably talk about it for an hour, what's in there. So I'm gonna to try to give you a bit of a high level view, but no, if you read it for yourself, you're gonna get a lot more detail about some very strong theories for what could have happened to Tara. Now, starting right off the bat, um, there are some suspects named and I'm not going to go into those specifically because I really don't have any information about the validity of this documentation, but I can tell you I have seen um, some documentation that I believe is faked before. It's usually pretty easy to identify, particularly in the style of the writing. And I have to say this documentation, I have also read through many, many police records, and this documentation seems to fit that. I believe that these are authentic documents. However, I do have to state, I don't know the source. Um, I don't know if this is stuff you can get with just a uh, Freedom of Information Act request, but these do feel extremely authentic. Um, I highly, highly suspect that these are real. So uh, just to give you a brief on it, it looks like there is a state agent that is starting to look into this as a cold case. Um, around 2010 and he starts getting into some areas where it seems like um, maybe he's not being supported by the local sheriff's department and they essentially tell him uh, that he needs to stop looking into this case further. It also mentions several times through here where he is actually meeting up with the filmmaker of that documentary that I was telling you about. Um, I believe the official title on that documentary is supposed to be Vanished, the Tara Calico story. But the, um, the woman that's making the documentary is coming to them saying she feels threatened for her life. She feels like she's being followed while she's investigating this case. Um, it seems like the agent doesn't really know if he needs to uh, put a lot of stock in what she's saying or not, but I can tell you by the time you get to the end of all this documentation, uh, I think it is perfectly reasonable to think that she might be being followed while she is investigating this case, possibly being threatened, um, but let's, let's continue. So she meets with him several times and eventually uh, he is basically told by the local uh, sheriff's department that it's in their jurisdiction and that he needs to stop investigating this because they are the lead agency on it. And at that point, he says he does and literally writes, case status closed on here. Then we jump forward a few years to October 2013 and we can see that there is a task force that has been put together to investigate the Tara Calico missing person case. Um, and this narrative gets very interesting uh, very quickly. 
if you go through all this, you're going to bump into what is essentially a bit of a deathbed confession by someone who claims to know people that committed a crime against Tara. Um, essentially that they did uh, hit her with their vehicle, took her and her bike to another location, um, did some horrible things to her, and then she, when she threatened them by saying that she was going to make sure that they would all be in jail, um, they did actually kill her according to uh, what he states there. Now there's some weirdness that starts around this because one of the people that he mentions happens to be the son of the sheriff. And not the same Rene Rivera uh, sheriff that is mentioned in the Wikipedia article, but the one prior to him who is Sheriff Lawrence Romero and apparently is the man that hired in Rene Rivera. And there is some talk throughout this documentation that essentially Rene Rivera is doing some type of cover up for information about this crime because it's Lawrence's son um, that is one of the suspects. Now apparently there was four guys that's all according to this information from this testimony, this supposed deathbed confession. So um, please take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but more importantly than that, I think you need to read it for yourself so you can really come to understand some of the details uh, that are being discussed here. Uh, after you get through that, there is some question about um, that confession being taped and what happens to that tape? Does it make it back to the sheriff's department? Is it put into official records or is it hidden potentially by someone in charge there? Once again, the filmmaker kind of pops back up and seems to suggest to an agent on this task force that um, you cannot find that tape, that there has been a record created for it, but the tape is basically not available. Um, I think by the end of this documentation, which we're now talking years later, it seems like the interview tape may have been recovered. Uh, it's a little hard to follow because there is a lot of narrative going on here and they're weaving in a lot of information from a lot of different people. Um, but the task force is very active. They were only planning on being around for three to four months and there's one agent that kind of gets um, a tip a little bit later. He's not even sure if the task force is still active, but he contacts some of the people he was working with and they're like, oh yeah, we're still working on this case. So um, it seems to go on from what I can see for about six months. Um, but there are several hints in it of potential cover up going on within the sheriff's department about this. There is information about a rock quarry of some kind. Uh, which happens to be next to a water source that keeps being brought up as being a potential spot where her body is um, and that people have actually stated that. So I got to tell you guys, after I got done reading all this, I kind of had this weird sick feeling in, in my stomach. I mean, it's it just really bothers me when uh, the possibility that law enforcement isn't doing the right thing kind of comes about. So I did a little looking into uh, Sheriff Rene Rivera and just doing a simple Google search on this guy. Um, well, you can see the first one is about Tara and the second one, Sheriff is dirty handed in Valencia County. Um, we can see another hit down here, husband murdered, Rene Rivera covered it up. Uh, I can tell you this thread about the dirty-handed uh, sheriff on topics.com, if you read through that thread, you're going to see several people very upset about uh, the sheriff and the way he conducts himself. Uh, once again, this is just people talking. Do I know if any of it's valid? I, I, I can't tell you for certain. Um, but it is interesting that when you read through that thread, there's not a lot of people arguing in the sheriff's favor. Uh, even when they do, they seem to agree that he's still not very good at what he does. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of people commenting that he's just straight up crooked. So what happened? Um, well, we get to November 2010 and we have this news story. Commissioner Donald Holliday used a heat gun to prove he found a cheap solution to remove Sheriff Rene Rivera's name from 20 patrol vehicles. This came one day after the sheriff lost his bid for re-election. Sheriff Rivera had put his name on the vehicles over the summer. If I would have known that he was doing that at the time, more than likely he would have gotten arrested. 
Luckily, uh, he at least did not get reelected. I did see uh, some news that he tried to run for election again in 2014 and uh, once again did not re-win his seat. Um, hopefully there's enough information out there, people are talking enough out there that if you do any very light web search on him, you're going to bump into the same type of information that I did. Um, I thought it was interesting that he felt like he needed to put his name all over his vehicles. <laughs> And I found it really interesting that a, uh, an official came and removed him with a heat gun. So it seems to me like there's some kind of shame or embarrassment going on uh, around this guy and around his type of work. Does that mean that he had something to do in this? I don't know for sure, but I can tell you that that investigation file is something to look through. Um, it does feel to me that there are some leads that were not followed up on, but I don't know how complete that file is. It might just be parts of the investigation. Uh, it does seem like they identified this rock quarry area. There is mention specifically about, about an agent trying to get to it. He's told that he needs to bring back a four-wheel drive vehicle and coordinate it with uh, someone that's out there. He's working to coordinate it, I think, in the following week, but then there's no follow-up notation about did he actually get out there, did he actually look for himself. Obviously, if Tara's body would have been found, I'm certain it would have made major, major media news and we would already know about it. Um, but is the answer in that documentation about what happened to her, about who did it, about a potential cover-up and about where she is? It's very possible to me. Um, it's certainly worth some more looking into. Now, luckily there is a new sheriff. Uh, I did see that he is considering this case still open. I think I saw a news clip from him as of, it was either late 2014 or early 2015 that they are still um, working this case. So, do I believe that uh, we will find the answer someday? Yes. But this is where I turn it over to you guys. Um, a few people have spoken up, if that documentation is true. I'm just going to preface it with that. A few people have come forward. But it seems like these guys were partiers. They were probably pretty loose-lipped. There are probably a lot more people that have information out there. They may have not stepped forward if there is an actual conspiracy cover-up going on in this area because they didn't feel comfortable with law enforcement. So if anything, I'm trying to appeal via this video to anyone out there that might have information about these guys in particular, about this site in particular. Maybe you happen to have heard where this bicycle is. There are a lot of key pieces out there that can really help solve this case. And you now have the... We know that there was two generations of sheriffs that seem to be working very close together uh, hand in hand there, and one of their sons may be responsible or at least involved in this case. It seems like those generations have now been removed. I think the new sheriff uh, deserves a fair shot at cracking this case. So if you have the information out there, please submit a tip on it. If you don't feel comfortable with the local sheriff's department, the FBI has also been working this case. So please submit it to the FBI. I have contact information for both the Valencia Sheriff's Department as well as the FBI down below. And please, 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 let's do what we can to try to get some answers for Tara's siblings and her stepfather, who before we go, last link here, um, 25 years and Tara is still missing. I miss her, said John Dole, Tara's stepfather. One of these days, hopefully we'll find out what happened, whether or not someone is held accountable for it, I just want to know what happened. We've been looking for some kind of closure for a long time. As the search for Tara went cold, John Dole said it became frustrating that no one could tie anything together. He said he hasn't heard from anyone in law enforcement for two to three years. So obviously, this man's still looking for answers. He needs some help, and I'm hoping that one of you out there might know or one of you might know someone that knows something about this case so please do me a favor if you have friends in the new mexico area please share this video with them let's get some exposure back to this case that had a ton of exposure but i think went off in a weird direction with a picture that might really have absolutely nothing to do with the truth of this matter um, let's see if we can get the focus back on this new documentation which According to that Scribd website, I think only 
6,000 people have reviewed that documentation in total. That's nothing for internet out there, for, for how many people can review um, that type of documentation. So please share this video, please share that documentation. Let's try to raise awareness to that information and hopefully someone can do the right thing with it. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I appreciate each and every one of you for watching these profiles and doing your best to help solve these cases with me. I hope you have a great day. I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord and Arts channel.